Up next, a middle-aged man looks for some excitement. He's just like any other guy that would go to a strip club. And later turns up dead. Police ask if the two are connected. She said she killed him, and I asked her why, and she said because they told her to. Police question the dancer's boyfriends. We do not allow boyfriends or husbands to be in the bar. Eventually, with forensic evidence and a little luck, the pieces start to fit. Many young men and women dream of working in the television or film industry. Pat McRae fulfilled that dream, and he was good at it. He worked at Iowa Public Television. He was a video production coordinator. He was very well liked at that place. Friendly face, kind of, he was always smiling when I saw him. McRae typically worked long hours. Unfortunately, it took its toll. In 1997, he and his wife of 12 years divorced. McRae took it hard, but remained a devoted father to his two young children. We would go over to my dad's every Wednesday, and we'd watch TV, hang out. He would uh, come to my football games, and we'd hang out at the varsity games, and you know, he'd take us out to eat, go to movies, stuff like that. McRae never missed an opportunity to spend time with his children, but one morning, there was a problem. He's supposed to pick up his daughter and take her to school. He's a no-show. Pat's ex-wife knew immediately something was wrong. She called both his work and home telephone numbers, but couldn't reach him. So she went to his home and used her own key to get inside. And she found Pat, dead, just inside the front door. There was significant blood patterns in the house itself. There were bloody footprints uh, throughout the house. The evidence shows the attack started in the living room and ended at the front door. It appeared that someone had used that bathroom to clean up. Robbery seemed to be the motive. Pat's wallet had been cut from the back pocket of his blood-soaked jeans. We could see that there had been a number of clothing items disrupted, thrown around on the floor of the closet, and that there was transferred blood on some of this clothing. So it at least visually appeared that somebody had, uh, you know, spent some time either searching through the closet or through the clothes. And the killer left bloody foot impressions outside on the porch. Of particular interest were that some of these uh, bloody footwear impressions were overlaid which fairly early on in the investigation gave indication that the one source uh, of these impressions had made more than one trip uh, exiting the house. The medical examiner estimated that Pat had been murdered sometime on Friday night, about 48 hours before his body was found. Investigators discovered that Pat spent part of that evening at a local strip club the outer limits. Pat McCraig was a customer that came in, and basically, he was a regular as far as maybe once or twice per week. Um, he was a very friendly, a very quiet guy. When Pat visited the club, he usually arrived around 10 o'clock. But on the night of his murder, he came in early. I was kind of like, you know, wow, what was he doing here during happy hour, which was fine. It was kind of unusual for him to do that. He also did something else no one had ever seen him do before. He asked for a private dance. The dancer's stage name was Mystic. She was the one that he went in the private area with. Pat moved from the front of the stage and went in the private area. I remember him dancing with Mystic in the back room. Mystic's real name was Laura England. And for some reason, on the day Pat McRae's body was found, Mystic didn't show up for work. Des Moines police thought they had a suspect in the murder of television station employee Pat McRae, a stripper named Laura England. 
She performed a private dance for Pat on the last night he was seen alive. Two days later, she was gone, and Pat was dead. She stripped Sunday night, danced Sunday night at the uh, Outer Limits, and then she and her boyfriend leave town. Police issued an all-points bulletin for Laura England. In the meantime, at the crime scene, investigators made some important discoveries. First, there were bloody boot prints throughout the house, and they had been made at two different times and several hours apart. You could see that somebody had exited the house and uh, then apparently re-entered. The boots were determined to be size 7 Doc Martin brand boots. All the blood evidence in the house was carefully cataloged and analyzed. Dozens of items were submitted for DNA testing. I ended up taking uh, 70 samples blood stains from the crime scene and processing those all the way through for DNA analysis. One blood stain stood out from the others. A drop of blood on the comforter on top of the bed. This was different than the smudges that appeared elsewhere in the room. Since the evidence indicated Pat McRae never entered the bedroom after he was stabbed, analysts thought this blood might be the killer's. There was a little bit of, of blood evidence in the bedroom, and it turns out that that little bit of blood evidence was probably the most significant evidence that, that we had in that case. The droplet was cut out of the comforter and tested along with other blood stains on the bed. The result showed a mixture of blood from two people. One of the contributors of the blood in the house is a female. The male DNA belonged to the victim, Pat McRae. This meant the killer was a woman. It's not uncommon for people when they're stabbing somebody else to stab themselves accidentally, maybe have their hands slip on the knife, cut the, the inner sides of their fingers. It's really quite common. Then police located Laura England. The dancer last seen with Pat McRae on the night he was murdered. But she denied seeing McRae that night and said the club manager must have been mistaken. She also wore wigs at the time, too, which a lot of dancers have done in, in the past. Laura's DNA didn't match the DNA from the unidentified female at the crime scene, and she was released. The DNA didn't match anyone in Iowa's state database or the national database, either. We had no one to compare that DNA profile with, uh, or at least I should say we had no one to go successfully compare it with. Investigators were convinced that Pat McRae knew his killer. There was no forced entry into the house, which meant he probably let the killer in. And the blood evidence showed rather brazen behavior. Blood on the front drapes indicated the killer opened the drapes to look outside. The bloody foot impressions proved the killer walked out of the front door after the murder. Not only that, the killer returned several hours later, leaving a second set of boot impressions, this time in dried blood. That's odd. If you leave a homicide scene, the chances of you going back to that scene and tracking blood out again is not very good. I mean, you, once you're out of there, you want to be out of there. The case turned cold, and for the next five years, there were no substantial leads. Was it possible that a killer this reckless could successfully elude police? For five years, the murder of Pat McRae went unsolved. Investigators had the DNA profile of the killer and boot impressions from the scene. What they didn't have was a viable suspect. I just kind of gave up worrying about whether or not it would get solved. I mean, I didn't like that it wouldn't, but I had that feeling that there's probably nothing we could do. Then, 
Detective Judy Stanley got a call from her counterpart in Lincoln, Nebraska, 200 miles away. Lincoln police had just arrested a man named Mars Davis on a drug possession charge, and Davis offered them a deal. He said he was willing to provide information about an unsolved murder in Des Moines in return for leniency on his drug charge. I felt tremendously guilty for a long time. I didn't want to think about it anymore. And it bothered me every time I closed my eyes. Unfortunately, Davis didn't know the name of the victim. He did, however, remember the neighborhood where he lived. He only knows that he lives at a house someplace off of Harding Road. He knows it's by a convenience store. He knows there's a couple of car washes nearby, knows that the guy works for a TV station, knows that he went to the Outer Limits, and knows that he's killed in his house. Mars Davis was describing Pat McRae's murder, and the details he provided were so bizarre, it was hard for investigators to believe. It's not a story that you uh, expect to hear every day in the news. Mars Davis said that five years earlier, he was involved with a 24-year-old stripper named Andrea Morris. She was good at her job. I liked watching her work the room, you know, because you'd see prettier girls or younger girls have trouble, and she would just, you know, mow them over. Andrea was working at the Outer Limits Club in Des Moines, but Mars wasn't permitted to go inside. We do not allow boyfriends or husbands to be in the bar. Maybe a customer, you know, might get a little rough with a, uh, with a girl, and her husband or boyfriend thinks he's got to handle the problem when I have employees to handle those kind of problems, you know, and it just causes a disruption. One night around closing time, Mars picked up Andrea after work, and she said she'd promised to give a bar patron a private dance at his house. It wasn't entirely out of the ordinary, but it wasn't exactly something that happened all the time, but yeah. And money was pretty tight, so I was, and she didn't ask me, you know, she just said, this is what's happening. And I said, okay. And how do we get there? <laughs> Davis said he dropped Andrea off and then went to get his truck washed. Mars tells her, I'll be back in one hour. So he leaves. He actually goes and cleans the Bronco while he's waiting for her to do this private dance. When he picked her up, he couldn't help but notice she was literally covered in blood. Can I tell me what the hell happened? She told me, like, she got hit in the nose or something, and, and I was like, oh, that didn't all come out your nose. <laughs> yeah, you know, and because it was in her hair, it was everywhere. You know, when she took her clothes off, it was in her underwear and her socks. You know, and I just kind of went numb after that. Did he hurt you? Do you want me to go back? No. When Mars pressed the issue, Andrea finally admitted the truth. She said she killed him, and I asked her why, and she said, because they told her to. Um, she heard voices. They later checked into a motel, took showers, and got some sleep. Several hours later, Andrea panicked when she realized she left her wallet in Pat McRae's home. She insisted Mars drive her back to Des Moines so she could retrieve her wallet. Everything in her wallet was coated with blood. I mean, it was like, you know, it had been sitting in it. You know? It was... <sighs> but how could police determine if Mars was telling the truth? Mars Davis gave us a ton of information that would not have been known to anybody other than that who was at that house. But how did they know he wasn't involved in the actual murder? For that, police needed to find 
Andrea Morris. Five years after Pat McRae's murder, a witness came forward to say he knew the identity of the killer. A nationwide search was on for Andrea Morris, a stripper who was dancing in the club Pat McRae visited on the night of his murder. Des Moines police learned Andrea Morris was recently released from prison in Nebraska after serving two years on a drug charge. She is required to give a DNA sample as part of her release. And so um, I find out who her probation officer is. I call her up. She says, you know what? I just had to take her DNA the other day. And it matched the DNA from the blood found in Pat McRae's bedroom. Andrea Morris was arrested at her apartment in Lincoln, Nebraska. And I introduced myself and told her who I was and that I was from Des Moines, Iowa. When the blood drained from her face and Terry and I, the other detective that was there, we, we both commented about that. Wow, do you think she's guilty or not? But Andrea said she was innocent, that Mars Davis was the killer. So I don't know which thing made me more angry, being accused of the murder or being called a pimp. Andrea admitted performing a private dance for Pat McRae in his home and said Pat attempted to assault her. She said Pat McRae pinned her to the couch and wouldn't let her up and was kissing her and she was trying to push him away and he wouldn't get up. Next thing she knows, Mars Davis is in the house over them and he's the one that starts stabbing Pat McRae. That was her story. But there was no blood all over the floor and only one set of foot impressions from a pair of size seven boots, the same size worn by Andrea Morris. Mars Davis wore a size 13 shoe. Big difference between a woman size seven and a man size 13. And we didn't have anything to put Mars in the house. Prosecutors believe that from the beginning, Andrea intended to rob Pat McRae. He sat on the couch in the living room for what he thought would be some harmless entertainment. Instead, Andrea pulled a knife and attacked him. He tried to fight back. The fight moved across the living room to the front door. McRae, weak from blood loss and shock, could no longer fight back. In all, Andrea stabbed him a total of six times. She used the knife to cut McRae's wallet from his back pocket. She also took his keys. A tremendous amount of blood had been spilled. Police think Andrea's contention that she got a nosebleed during the struggle was probably the only thing about her story which was true. That's how her blood dripped onto the comforter on Pat's bed. She walked through the rooms, trying to clean up the blood, but there was simply too much of it. Blood found on the curtains showed she opened them to see if Mars had returned. When he arrived, Andrea left through the front door and locked it on her way out, tracking fresh blood across the front porch. Several hours later, when she realized she'd left her wallet behind, she returned, tracking dried blood on top of the foot impressions left earlier, proving there were two separate visits. And proving Mars Davis had been telling the truth. She said that she, she killed the guy. Did she say why? Um, because they told her to. They mean who? These voices that she heard in her head. Andrea Morris, almost unrecognizable from her days as a stripper, maintained her innocence. But the jury didn't buy her story. In October of 2007, she was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life 
without parole. She deserved what happened. Yeah, and it was a really thing, and, and I feel kind of about, you know, doing it to her, but, you know, it was either live with it or, you know. The Pat McCray case shows how a single drop of blood can be the difference between a conviction or an exoneration. When I calculated the statistics of a match on that sample, it turned out to be fewer than one of a, out of 100 billion unrelated individuals would be expected to have that same DNA profile that was found on the piece of evidence. Forensic evidence was the key to the entire case. Um, there was just great DNA evidence. It's very gratifying that uh, physical evidence established at the initial scene uh, on the initial day uh, eventually is what uh, ended up absolutely uh, placing her within the scene and uh, being the, the, the thing that convicted her.